Okay. Try, um, is, it, is it you? Is it this one, Twitter visualizations? So I'm doing all the steps. Um, basically, Olaf is. Uh, you guys can hang out, but it's. Uh, we're just streaming just in case you want to follow these steps. So I made a directory called Olaf, and I put some CSV files of my own history in here. So Olaf is going to try to show us. Um, let's see. So now I have his git repo called Twitter visualization. Should I descend into that and then put the RAS data there? Right. Any specific? Oh, no. uh, it doesn't matter. Change. No, it needs to be in the data folder. Oh, okay. I see. So mkdir data. No, no. no. Uh, or uh, do cd. So the data no, folder sorry. needs um, to be uh, ls. Um, oh, okay. And go into the CD Twitter. Yeah. Error uh, n in the data folder. So, or create a data folder here? No, there should be one. Um, maybe it gets deleted. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't upload any data. Yeah. And make directory data. And then I want to move the. It's okay. So then this to data folder. Yeah. So now, um, head data ah. is so that's where the. Okay, so now, what do you want me to do? Um, node server dot Node server. So I only have node and node JS. Node space server. Server dot JS. Yeah, it's a script. So if that doesn't work, then I'm lost. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, node is the command yeah. because. Um, yeah, right. So um, this is to set up uh, uh, a server-side JavaScript runtime, and um, so we're gonna do node server and what? Uh, go back. Server dot. It's, oh, yeah, server dot JS. Oh, it's the file here. Right. Yeah. Enter. Yep. You shouldn't be in the data folder though. In the, um, I am up, up, upstairs. Uh, and then I want to copy this localhost thingy. Okay, so server is running on 8080. <laughs> okay, so it's going to. Um... All right, guys, so let's. Uh, we're online. Uh, we're going to start. Um, so, what I'm going to. Uh, we'll jump here once mm -hmm. I go through the. So people are asking um, about some things. So the answers are here. Um, so this is now exploring a user timeline. Okay. So um, so the idea is to do um, D three in place interactive visualization within Spark SQL. We're not there yet, but we'll show you how it works uh, locally. Uh, so the latest MEP project in action. So it's a uh, iterative experimental designs in Twitter, and the goal here is to empower uh, field ethnographers in theology uh, and conflict studies in the Center for Multidisciplinary Studies and Racism at the Humanities Theater here in English Park. So these are um, and you know and others like um, 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 you know Simon to do scalable ethnographic explorations, right? So that's kind of the I just heard about the word ethnographic yesterday, so it makes sense. So what's the main plan? We we're going to do a, a REST API. Uh, just, there are two main APIs in Twitter, REST and streaming. So we're going to obtain user information from the screen name. And then we're going to obtain user timelines from tweet ID. Um, and then um, this is something I said is a precursor for these breadth first recursions on the historical timelines of populations of interest. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can always uh, do more. And I pointed out that currently we're using legacy Spark streaming. So this is like a legacy uh, year old <laughs> in this world. 
So eventually we would like to move this to a uh, proper structured streaming so that we can do stream to stream joins and stream to back joins on, um, on our streaming data. Because in the new structured streaming API, the formalism is one of infinite tables coming at you. And you can do way faster processing as well. So it's uh, not just micro batching. So we already installed JSON and Twitter4j. So um, we just evaluate these cells. And, and then, uh, yeah, this is something you guys have to fill out if you want your, um, your, um, your stuff. So, so this will give you an ID, right? Force whatever, some ID. So this is how you can easily go from uh, user screen names to uh, the uh, long ID. Okay. Um, and then for real Donald Trump .get ID will give you this integer, right? Long. So then uh, I can um, do this uh, little function. I you know call it lookup user screen name. Uh, this basically takes a sequence of uh, strings, uh, uh, you know, Twitter user IDs as strings, and then it does this grouped, so it groups into, you know, if it's a very long list of thousands of people you want to track, there's as many as you want to, population of interest, then it just is like some hack around Twitter's uh, REST API limit. So you, you, would, you would ask for information in groups of 100, because um, Twitter allows you to do that. It's more efficient than just looping one at a time. That's this little function that helps you with that. Now this will be your user screen names of interest. So I just wanted, to, and now don't put the at symbol on this one. Uh, it's the it's the user screen name without the at symbol, right? So in this case, I just tried myself and Trump. And then um, the lookup user screen name, uh, when it's passed in this uh, sequence or list of strings, will now go and fetch for us the uh, Twitter 4J user object. So this is all the information about the user, right? This is basically what's in your, in your Twitter profile, public profile. So the name is Donald J. Trump, email is null, screen name is real Donald Trump, location is Washington, DC, description is 45th president of the United States, etc., etc. Okay, it's profile text color, background color, blah, blah, blah. US Eastern Standard Time. Time. So is there a, uh, there's a lot you can do with the fetch list. So for example, you can just do a simple map operation and get the IDs and convert them to a set because maybe there are multiple uh, screen names with the same ID. So making it a set will make it distinct and then you convert to a sequence and filter all those that are null. Right? So you don't want, to, so often, especially if you chase people in the sort of more extreme uh, corners of Twitter, they, they will get their, um, their uh, mm -hmm. Um, um, usernames revoked, right? Um, but also, apparently, Don did something where. <laughs> what did you do with Twitter revoked you because he didn't put a cell phone? Yeah. So he can be a very nice guy doing pure mathematics in a beautiful corner, but if you don't fill in the <laughs> form appropriately. I just created a flag that missed it, and I tried logging in today, and it was blocked because of. Uh, they thought I had done some automated stuff. Yeah. So, also or yeah. so they have like a lot of algorithms. In fact, Amelia sent me something from her um, uh, thing about what Google uh, YouTube has been doing to automatically take rem remove videos to fight pornography and stuff like this. So, and I've had a lot of people that are sort of have their boots on the ground doing field studies and conflict studies. Their accounts have been taken down also by Facebook because they're tracking people or not tracking, they're just interested in what's happening in the ground, right? They're tracking various fascist or anti fascist movements just to go and do field work. And then if they sort of not like, but they shared this information somehow on Facebook, and then Facebook thinks, oh, there is a picture of some Hitler or whatever, that's the symbol, and then they take it. So these are, you know, yeah, these are some machine learning operations. Right? So we create a directory name, uh, make sure it's clean first, and then remake it. And um, this, unfortunately, guys, is very hacky. I kind of it's it the the version I used to do my U.S. election study was a lot cleaner, but then it's gone through several rounds of uh, research grad students, so it's this kind of it works, but um, there is a lot of issues. Uh, you know, I, I really need a full day to clean this up. I'll try and do this before June fifteenth, but um, oh, this part is okay. This is just a function that writes to Parquet file, 
uh, and, and creates a case class. But this one is the really, yeah, I need to sit down because the problem is Java 4J. Uh, I think the programmers are returning null pointers. Uh, I, I don't know for sure because I get this null pointer exception at random and there is a proper way to field it in Scala, you know, because this is kind of a Java programmer thing, like return a null pointer and then the comment is usually, this should never happen. <laughs> anyway, so I so it's not robust, but it's robust in the sense that in case someone pulls your network plug out and stuff, it'll keep track of everything you've collected so far so you can restart it from where you've left off. And that collection so far is in the distributed file store, right? So I just write everything you've collected so far to a parquet. It's not really proper data engineering science, but anyway, it works. It basically can be given a huge list and then it groups them into, say, into chunks of 100, and then for each of those hundreds, it waits, you know, to, it tries to, you know, if, if you reach the Twitter API limits, it waits for the right amount of time, or think, and then, uh, you know, you have to thread sleep and whatever. So, and I don't really want to collect it in parallel accounts without my own credentials. So I don't like do this, it gets, it's too much information anyway, <clears throat> even if you run with one guy. Uh, that's what this is doing. So it's basically so and then if you if you run that you should get this So this is just showing what has been collected already downloaded. So these are my I just ran it this morning, right? 6.59 a.m. Today I started my life at 3.30, you know, which is good <laughs> um, so here um, is the uh, DBFS. So if you look at it, you see I'm also writing into these little ID files for every 100 chunks. I put an integer 0, 101 to 200. If you have a long list, it just writes it because I kind of want to fight the small files problem in a hacky way. But still, now when I sort of filter by the timeline user ID to be this, which is uh, my Raza zone data frame, so my own uh, historical timeline. Uh, and it ran and um, it gave me some some number of events and um, yeah and I can just read that um, uh, from Parquet and I, in the morning it, it collected 800 events for me and then I ran uh, so for Trump uh, I only got 300 and these are not very precise because uh, there are some modular remainder operations missing in the hacky thing upstairs it used to collect uh, up to 3,200 events in the past, uh, if there are that many events. But I'm not that active in Twitter. It's gotten almost all of mine. So then I just wanted to show real Donald Trump's thing. So this is what you actually fetch, the timeline user ID. So I get the same Trump's ID, and then the tweet ID uh, that he did, and then when it was created, this whole content of the status update as the one nice JSON string. This is exactly the JSON string we are using in our <coughs> streaming job. So it's, uh, this is how it looks when you display it. Okay. So now the idea is that uh, we can do this DDDF and convert to a tweet transmission tree object. So it's a little easier to sort of play with. And the same thing for a real Donald Trump. And so now you actually have the historical timeline, you know, with at least a couple hundred tweets into the past you've grabbed. If, uh, some in, a user of interest or a population of interest in that list, and um, so uh, what uh, all of so what we want to do is to actually integrate this. You know, remember when I did the wiki click streams? There are these D three visualizations you can interact with. That's what we would like to do, so that we can pass in SQL expressions on the fly, and then have this visualization come in Databricks under display HTML. But we're not there yet. But I think I'm going to let all of uh, now jump in and uh, we just started this, um, what was it? I thought I had my quotes here. So, um, so we, he, he, this is what we did. Um, um, so I just launched a, a terminal and, uh, and I cloned this repo uh, in GitHub and he emailed me my history that he downloaded as a CSV file from that uh, table we've just seen. And then um, he's going to show us uh, what happens in D3. Is the data there? Is it working? Yeah, the data is there. I don't know how to make it work, right? I, I Try user timeline. Oh, yeah, this one? Yeah, just displaying that. Okay. 
There you go. User tweets from Raz. <laughs> yeah, so you can show us what's going on. Yeah, so I've been um, at this for the last couple of weeks, and this is D3 that Raz has been talking about. Um, so basically, here's his timeline, all his data. Um, because when you, uh, when you um, approach hundreds and, and even thousands of tweets, it's kind of hard getting a grasp of a user. So I made this visualization that you can, uh, can use to just explore. And uh, look at that. Current financial age. Yeah, so here, uh, here we have Raz, I guess. Um, and the purpose of this is, is there hopefully... You go, that's Noam <laughs> 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 to uh, to uh, maybe if someone wants to say you want to take a look at Trump or uh, another anyone of uh, of interest, they can just use this one and, and get a nice little overview when you're doing your exploratory data analysis. And that's kind of my my goal with the project. This is my undergrad part of my undergraduate project. We have some more <laughs> visualizations going to. You can also do some searches for. I don't know, America, you're at it. <laughs> Good, yeah, I have no idea what's going on. American <laughs> forces in Aleppo, right? Yeah. And then if you click the actual intercept link, it'll take me to the, to the whole conversations, right? Yes, then I'm not sure you're logged in. Yes, you are. And then you can read all of it. So uh, basically, it's, uh, I, I hope it's a nice little tool if you want to explore a user. So if, if anyone's interested, just Tell me, and I can. Uh, it's all available. You have to collect the data by yourself, but otherwise, the the code's on GitHub, so you can just collect it and use it if you want to, if you're interested. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I like this part, it took a while. <laughs> oh wow! Oh right, these are the tweets of my uh, video or something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of silly, right? Because I'm not too active in Twitter, but you can do this on anyone, basically. And I guess if we can figure out how to do this within the, the Databricks display environment, then yes. we're like really set. Because you can start doing SQL expressions, you can have a huge list of thousand people, and and really do this cleanly. Um, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> so can you show this other stuff, like uh, if you go back, you you did these other things, right? Oh well. yeah, I have those. Um, so this is. Basically nothing, but uh, it might be like a note, like the Giphy thing we saw yesterday. But that's nothing as of right now. Um, but this one, you don't have the data for it though. But yeah, maybe you get so the point. Have, yeah, so we've been looking at uh, the number of retweets and number of unique retweeters. It's a way to summarize the retweet network. So we've been sort of studying this for the last two weeks of the Swedish election collection uh, job. And uh, it gives you a very nice idea of, uh, and I didn't really want to show this publicly because it tells you who the most influential members of parliament are. And, and it's very interesting, I think. So, um, yeah. OK, thanks a lot, Olaf. Um, it's great. So how do I kill the Node.js server? Thing Control. Control C. Uh, C. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so here's the history of commands. So in case uh, um, uh, let's see. <coughs> yeah, so I did git clone HTTPS. So this is basically how you, you know, if you install git on your system, you can clone Olaf Bjork's Twitter visualization dot git. Now this sort of becomes yours. It, and, is this Apache 2 licensed or what did you license yeah. it as? Okay, so you can you know make a living off of it if you want. And then um, there's, um, you know, so I just seeded into it and made a directory called data. And then the, the file he sent me by email, I just put it there. But hopefully we will do this uh, in-house in Databricks soon. And then I just checked that uh, the file had content with the head command. And then I just uh, man node and uh, made sure that's the, server uh, node um, it just uh, launches a local uh, web server and then his uh, server.js script so I'm a VI guy you know so he this is what he's doing he's connecting and with Alice and there's a function 
And I think, I guess your main main code is what, uh, it's inside JS, right? Yeah. So he's got CSL style sheets. And um, so those of you who know about, uh, so I guess user timeline is what we want to mm -hmm. look at. So the others are in progress, right? So this is basically, and, um, and uh, thanks to Ivan, like from New Zealand, he's been sort of showing us how to get going on turning this thing into a data set directly in Spark SQL so we can pass the data set it turned into a JSON string into uh, this HTML display thing you need. So it's, it should be doable just like the clicks thing will do work. Okay, so um, let's, um, <clears throat> let's get back to um, Yeah, so we did track and follow, right? And um, so now let's do a Twitter hashtag counter, right? Because remember, we were just like collecting data. Now we want to do some operations on it. Um, so, um, so what's the main main plan here? We um, get our Twitter utils going. Um, so let's see. Yeah, I think my stuff. Yeah, I hope this all works now. Um, so what I'm, I have an output directory, <clears throat> a slide interval um, of a second. And then now I have new things like window length. So I have like a, a three second window length. And then I also have a um, wait W seconds before stopping the streaming job. So I, I want it to be patient before it gives up. So then um, I just want to make sure there's no streaming context running in case I started something. Uh, I want to clean my output directory and um, so this is a um, you know so now I have this little helper class used for ordering by the second value in a string in tuple. I think that's the question Michael asked I think right if you want to um, so here I want to order by the second element in the tuple so then I have the second value ordering object which extends ordering so it just does this uh, comparison thing. So this way I can order by the most popular hashtags basically. So then I, you know, our, our familiar friend uh, creating funk is here. It uh, returns a streaming context. And if you look inside, it's basically almost the same, except now I have my uh, hashtag stream. So what's the hashtag stream? It takes a Twitter stream and it maps the underscore dot get text, which is a, which is a method. That's implemented on the Twitter objects that are coming at me. And uh, then I do a flat map where I split by white space and then I filter by everything that starts with a hashtag. This is very similar to what Simon was doing. And then uh, I want to compute the counts of each hashtag by window. So I do reduce by key and window of length window length. So it means as my sliding window progresses, I want to reduce by key and specific window. So this is a um, you know windowed hashtag count stream is the immutable, and I take my hashtag hashtag stream which is pure hashtags now, and then I'm mapping the, each hashtag to the integer one, and I'm doing reduce by key and window. Right, this is slightly different. Right? You saw reduce by key, but then we also want to do window specifically, three second sliding window specifically. And what is it doing? It takes um, you know, it's a reduce operation and it knows it's by, by the key and the window. So that's all implicit. So I just have to say, just add my, my hashtag counts, X plus Y. But I also have to specify the window length and the slide interval as parameters to this method. Okay, so for each window, calculate the top hashtags for that time period. And then I use the second value ordering helper method upstairs and only report the top 20. I hope this works. <laughs> um, 
yeah so now we're going to uh, create our streaming context and start it So there is it working for anyone? Okay, I think it's working for me too. So you see, um, Todd Small Goats one, I don't know, there's a lot of non ASCII characters here. Some Japanese. I don't know. Korean. I mean, you know, so you, you can see that uh, the top hashtags are just two, three, and one. So you can play with the window size and whatever. Right? Um, so these are the top 20 in that. Um, so let's um, so typo. Um, so I think it should automatically stop the streaming job after the timeout length. So let's see what's happening on my cluster. Yeah, so it automatically stopped it. Um, so, so did you guys get it working? I mean, that's now very powerful, right? So now you can start doing not just reduce by key and window, but you know you can you can start coupling that with uh, uh, whatever you want in, in, in Spark Core. What does it mean by subhash windows? Uh, so top hashtag for Windows was uh, just uh, validly declared, right? Which one? So you want to. So yeah, zero one. So that's just the one to. Yeah, I've I've set it up to stop automatically, um, but um, yeah, I mean I'm basically you know um, writing it to a directory, and um, so we can um, look at this. So you know, it's just that uh, for Windows Zero, right? Um, this is the topmost hashtag. I don't know, hashtag premios MTV meow three. I don't know if this will be the case for everyone, but that's what I'm collecting in my sampling. Uh, and so if you go down, there should be a top hashtags for Windows 1, Windows 0, Windows 1, Windows. Uh, so I'm only, yes, yeah, I'm only done two. I think it's just stopped quickly. Um, yeah, so what, because I, I did my timeout job length to be very short, right? So you can you know, play with that. But, um, so here is, so let's view the results. Uh, I, I wrote it to this output directory, right? I mean, it's just, uh, so here is all the, uh, that's the size. There should be 100, 100 intervals for each second and the top hashtag for each of them should be in the file top hashtags thingy. So let's see, what is this top hashtags? So yeah, I think I changed it to a much smaller number, but um, let's do zero. So this is what I was printing uh, line by line. So it's also saved in a file so you can look at it. And just change the timeout job length to be a big number. So what could we do with this type of streaming capability? All kinds of things, right? So there's a lot of guys from business school, so you can do live marketing. There are services, service providers that actually, you know, feed into Twitter and look at how the product is doing. Uh, uh, this is just top hashtag thing, but you can also use, you know, filters or look for strings and stuff using other methods we saw earlier. Uh, there's a whole field called pharmaceutical vigilance. So there's the Uppsala Mon Monitoring Center downtown. So they were at that time doing experiments with this kind of pharmaceutical vigilance, which is because they have this global database of all the medicines and the, their uh, chemistry and stuff. And then if there is adverse reactions, people complain about it uh, in various social media. Twitter is a cheap one to kind of keep a tab on and see if there's any kind of 
you know adverse uh, you know uh, reactions um, and stuff like that. Right, and of course I'm interested in Twitter activity and mass media activity and so on. So this other notebook is uh, something uh, sort of assigned as a as a homework. Uh, Twitter language classifier. This was already done, uh, I you know, by uh, one of the students uh, last semester. So this is kind of an exercise for you guys. Uh, I think um, you know, uh, it's just a very simple classifier that um, you can you can do. Uh, Mahindra Shrestha, who took this course last semester, just did it. I I let students just do random things for ten minutes. It's one of those things, and. Um, so I think this is the reference notebook in Databricks. You can see it's a GitHub I.O. Uh, a, a book chapter. So and you can watch this guy's video and um, you know watch his talk. And he talks about how he started collecting tweets and doing classification of uh, the language of the, just from the tweet without looking at the language tag. And then because the language tags are usually there, then you can see how well your classifier did, right? So that's kind of the, so I don't want to get into this, um, but um, this is a, a highly recommended homework, you know, so you can do a little bit more about, um, um, so yeah, everything is pretty much the same, except, um, so I think uh, uh, Amendra had to change, uh, yeah, add a language field or something to the TTD data frame. Some slight changes you may need, but um, so what did you do basically? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Huh? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of asses, so I don't, uh, yeah. Someone's key is in there. Sort of yeah, so I mean, this is, so he did stuff, right? Like, I'm just not saying this is going to work if he constantly click. Because he had to, this is, you know, work. So he modified the O25A extended twiddles to run, and uh, I think he just put his own Twitter keys there. I don't know what he did. But, but you guys know enough about how to get the, so, you know, it's just a template, right? So, um, so he's put his own, his own keys. I think he said he revoked it or something. But I mean, all, all I want you to sort of, the only new thing is here is you have to watch the video and uh, read the book, the Git book that's linked on the top and stuff. But all I want to point out is that uh, doing, um, doing classification is a fairly straightforward task. So once you select the language, uh, you know, so he's doing SQL, um, this registers the table and so, you know, here are the language tags, and um, um, then he's counting the tweets, I think, that are coming in different languages. And then, um, yeah, he's basically doing k-means based clustering, and that was the main reason I wanted you guys to get into k-means. It's a trivial, I mean, yeah, it's a simple clustering, and um, but he's using um, other things like bigrams, so he's getting, I mean, this is from the original video that um, is here. So I'll uh, kind of leave this as a mystery, right? So it's uh, it should you guys should be able to do this, and um, you know, k means train vectors, and you know, x k is ten clusters. Uh, this max iteration is how many iterations you're running the k means algorithm and things like that. Okay, and then he's sort of seeing how well it does, and it's just following exactly uh, what's in that video and that book. But it's already Databricks five up to uh, minor changes. So that's a good um, um, homework, or uh, it's not an assignment, so you don't have to do it. Now let's sort of um, okay. So I kind of you know uh, too much content basically. So I wanted to um, you know not 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 um, what do you call it cheat you. <laughs> so this is a nice picture, right? This is the G Delt project. I want to mention a few words about it, and I'm going to sort of let you uh, wiggle your pinky toes into this ocean of GDELT. I myself am doing just that right now, but it's super important. And it's, um, uh, what is this exactly? So the GDELT project um, is here. It's 
it's an incredible project. Um, querying, analyzing, and downloading. So let's go to intro. So let's go here. It's a global database of society supported by Google Jigsaw. The GDL project monitors the world's broadcast, print, and web news from nearly every corner of every country in over 100 languages. So let me quickly read this. Um, um, and identifies the people, locations, organizations, themes, sources, emotions, counts, quotes, images, and events driving our global society every second of every day, creating a free open platform, platform for computing on the entire world. And so this does automatic entity extractions with the full-blown uh, logic behind it. A lot of it is done uh, by Google Translate, and it's, it's a lot. So if you, instead of just going and doing your own Python libraries to do entity extraction, all of that stuff, you can just start from here and uh, and then uh, you know go and reinvestigate that part. So let's play this little video for a minute. I wanted to use this information in the middle of a study how the connections between countries change over time and how they change for perhaps with big events that happen. So the idea of the Gino project really is how do we create a dashboard for the volcano society? We know everything occurring on our natural world today. But what about a bigger uh, What about a massive protest that erupts on the planet? Imagine mean, creating a data service dashboard. Isn't that really what the Gino project is about? Okay, so this is Google's big query, right? I told you with those atomic clocks and interval timestamps. <laughs> anyway, um, it's quite neat. There are many words posted to Twitter. Okay, so there's a lot going on. So they feed into this as well, into Twitter as well. And um, um, so anyway, I'm learning about this and uh, I will, I hope to learn more about it by next week. So we'll try and do this in the geospatial module. But uh, what I wanted to um, show you is uh, I started out already, so and I want to give a little ad for this book. Um, this is uh, this book called Mastering Spark for Data Science. I'm almost three quarters done with reading every word of the book, but uh, I only tried out uh, about half of the actual code. So a lot of it is available in Zeppelin notebooks, and I'm kind of trying to data bricksify it. But it's written by these four guys. Um, Andrew Morgan, Antoine Amend, Matthew Hallett, and David George. And I met Andrew and Antoine when they gave a talk at the Apache Spark Summit in Dublin. And uh, they were doing some really interesting stuff. But they're like hardcore data engineering scientists with a lot of enterprise background, and they really consult for London's big data industry. Antoine works in some cyber operations for Barclays Bank. And anyway, they're all over the place. So they're very experienced. So a lot of these little things we're doing is kind of simple and uh, it's okay to get started to build intuition. So what we want to do to run this is to import uh, um, uh, this, this um, you know, com amend spark.gdelt. So this is another library you have to import. And maybe in the interest of time, let's not get into the mechanics of it because we will come back to it. I just want to give you sort of a uh, possibly coming attraction. So once you import this, this is literally like last week old GitHub library. So, um, so you know, you, you, you have to uh, yeah, use the jar possibly. So then I'm, what I've done here is I've, I've just curled this GDELT project. So GDELT project um, has various files and it's like a lot of documents to read. It's too much detail. But one thing is called GKG, which is a global knowledge graph. And it's the CSV formatted thing which uh, already does all these um, you know, events. You know, when you see this world spinning thing, all these red bubbles, that's the number of protests, number of killings that are happening in real time. So every 15 minutes, 
uh, this GKG file gets updated in real time and anyone can download it. Right? So, um, you know, there's a bit more going on. I, I'm not showing you the sort of boilerplate stuff. I'll start with that when I do this properly. So I know this file exists and I pulled it down and then I've unzipped it, just copied into a dbfs. So this is another shortcut uh, person fs copy. So now it's loaded into dbfs. And um, by using this very recent library from last week or so, I can just use a, just a few commands and I can start reading all these events already. GKG, record ID, published date, source collection identifier, and there's a lot going on, you know, where's the document identifier, and um, you know counts what is the enhanced counts what are the themes so these are the various entities that were extracted in the theme category so there's tax and all these things are tax fnc act there are actually uh, other indices you need to look at to figure out what they mean but you know just uh, i just want to say that uh, these sort of entity extracted um, global knowledge graph is already there for you, especially the parsing is very difficult if you get into it directly. And there are various um, event types, cameo event, and um, a lot of this won't make sense until you get into the docs. But um, you can get religion codes, and you know, if there is any ethnicities mentioned in the news article, those are automatically picked up and tagged. If there is any group codes or cameo event codes, like you know, killing or protest or whatever. Um, and you know, country code, region code, and things like this. So um, then um, you can just display them. So as your sort of cameo value, this cameo code corresponds to this cameo event. Make optimistic comment, consider policy opinion, deny responsibility. You know, it's a lot of stuff. Okay. So and there's like a whole communities of people and scholars who who sort of do these uh, entity extractions for. Um, express intent to engage in material cooperation. So I, I haven't gone further than that, but I want to show you, let's see, maybe we'll descend into that. And that will, in a way, maybe nicely uh, merge with the geospatial modules um, that we will do in the next couple of weeks. Because it has an inherent geospatial element, right? Because the newspaper article has an entity, uh, which is a location entity, and then we can sort of map it on the Okay, so, oh right, that was going to be um, the last thing I think I was going to show you guys. Um, yeah, so this is basically, so it's kind of, it's kind of coming attraction maybe. So what I, what I um, want to do uh, to balance things out, because we're over Twitter focused. First of all, it's only one social media, <laughs> right? And uh, of course, a lot of researchers use Twitter because it's open, um, and so you can see what's going on. Uh, but I don't want to is make you know this course all about Twitter. So I I, I really wanted to give a a different uh, perspective. So. This particular thing, Old Bailey Online, is uh, maybe the quintessential data set for digital humanities, which is a, a larger field than digital sociology. Right? It uh, in, in, includes digital sociology. But, and uh, the, the, so I did this work um, with these guys. Um, let's see. There was some kind of paper somewhere. Anyway, we'll come to that. So I, I, I met these historians or digital historians at, at Canterbury, and now uh, um, um, James Smithies, um, who was one of the co-authors of this work, it's still in reviews in um, a top stats journal. Uh, he's a director of King's College London. So King's, King's College London is a very interesting place because they coined the word digital humanities. So they had the first department of digital humanities, as far as I know, in the late 70s or something. Uh, they have master's students like, I don't know, hundreds, <laughs> you know, because the digital humanities is like a really good foundation, master's level for doing things like data journalism, data intensive journalism, you know, all these things, and also digital history. So, for example, a, a scholar who wants to study Hillary, sorry, uh, even Bill Clinton is already has to know a little bit about uh, programming. Because, you know, just analyzing the, the communications in the Library of Congress involving Clinton is no human can read it. So you need to be able to zoom in on what's relevant and you have to make these 
topic models and graphs and then try and actually read in a reasonable time, right? So already history is, uh, you know, it's already a big data subject. Um, so that's kind of the, the sort of high level thing. And, and there's a big team in, uh, in uh, um, that's behind this uh, Old Bailey online. That's what I'm, I'm uh, showing here. And um, so my, I don't know, fourth master's student in New Zealand worked on this, Jasper McKinsey. So um, at that time, they were not making the data public. So we had to do all these API calls. And so here is the notorious court uh, called uh, London's Old Bailey. It's the London Central Criminal Court from 1674 to 1913. And what is interesting here is because uh, we were talking about law, this is really interesting because this gives you the transcripts of everything that was said in the court all this time, every, you know, every event is recorded in detail into XML files. And uh, it shows you how the English law itself evolves over time. So a law is just not, you know, law is an evolutionary process as well. So, um, you know, you really need to get into this, uh, but, um, you know, in the beginning, you know, people are just, uh, you know, the courts were just, you can see the formation of the court system and the judici judiciary uh, through time here. You know, people do crazy things and other people thought, oh, this is not acceptable. So then let's bring this guy like, what do we do with them? You know, whatever, he stole something or killed someone or whatever. So when there was this kind of uh, justice uh, spontaneously emerging and then it became more and more systematic and, um, you know, um, so you, you see all of that evolving here. Um, and uh, of course, like there's whole groups all over the world, including Germany, that spent their you know careers on analyzing this data and doing incredibly detailed natural language processing uh, from a historical law evolution perspective. So we did this little work. So we kind of said, okay, um, that's great, but I want to look at it using some very elementary statistics. So um, I'll just kind of walk through this in a few minutes. It's almost coming attraction for the theory parts of uh, uh, module four. And because uh, there's a mixed audience here, I can't really go through the, what we're doing in detail yet. Okay, but I'll give you a big picture. So non-parametric means what? No, it's not, yeah, in some sense. So you're not assuming a finite dimensional family of distributions. So what is an example of a finite dimensional family of distributions? So, um, you know, in our, uh, what, did, what did we see this morning, clustering, right? It means clustering. I told you there's a probability model under the hood, right? The probability model are spherical Gaussians with centers, right? So, you know, maybe this has a wider variance or so this is a wider variance, but so this is kind of a probability model under the hood for Canyon's clustering, Gaussian distributions, A2D, whatever. So this here, the, what is the parameter space? The parameter space is just, uh, this is uh, mu1. Uh, uh, let's see, how do I do this? Yeah, mu1, mu2, super uh, one. So two formal mu one mu two superscript two. So this is the second cluster's center for the pair. This is the third cluster center, right? In threes. So there's uh, three cluster centers. So this is the sort of mu one axis and mu two axis. I mean, sorry, this is the data axis. So you have data points x one x two. So. So a bunch of things will maybe end up here if you're lucky with the scanning spin. You know, this will be maybe more spread out and this will be much more concentrated and less, okay? So now here the parameter space is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So it's, okay, I six dimensions, but it's an R6, right? So the parameter space theta, which is all these six mu's, is an element of R to the six. So, this is finite, right? This is less than infinity. So that's, uh, so this is a parametric model. This is not non-parametric. Uh, so what's the simplest example of a non-parametric model? You will see this in week, uh, in the first uh, 
day of, of four. So the simplest example of a non-chromatic experiment is this. You have x1 through xn. They are coming, these are points in 1D that are coming according to some unknown distribution function. Right? So this is, a, we'll also define what a distribution function is later. But if you assume that the distribution function is uh, an element of the Gaussian family, right, normal, with uh, unknown mean, right, some unknown mean, and let's say known sigma, one, this is a very restrictive assumption of what f can belong to. So the only unknown parameter is mu, which is again any point in the reals, right, it's one dimension. So for that, the distribution, the true distribution function may be like this. Uh, roughly, so this is say uh, mu, variance one, and so, uh, but then, um, and then you would you would do something called a maximum likelihood estimate, which we'll cover also in detail in the foundations course, and you can get this thing. But this may not be the case. So if I want f to be instead of this, if I want f to be an element of the set of all distributions, all distribution functions. So to properly understand this, you need to know what are the definitions that need to be satisfied by the set of distribution functions. But for example, you can the true distribution function can be like this. It can have no values here. It can have a jump, and then it can do some, some, uh, okay, something like this. It can jump again, and you know it can go down. It's a non-decreasing function, right? So it can do something like this, and then sort of and it has to max out at one. Right? This is so it's a valid distribution function. And of course, there's like uncountably infinitely many of these objects. Okay, this is not even we'll also learn about what is countably infinite and uncountably infinite in the foundation, of course, so don't worry. So now if you want to take this point and turn and, and estimate this crazy f, which could be the true f, then you construct something called the uh, you know, so you, so because there's a point mass, a lot of points will fall here. So it's called so it's discrete and continues on mixed in. So maybe you know, say this is say 0 0.31, and you have like a billion samples. So roughly 31 fraction percent of the points will fall here. Okay. So you just basically do this little step function, and you make it jump by one over n, and then you get this little thing. So we'll, we'll do all this constructively later. Um, so again, there will be a jump, jump, and uh, so, okay, so a jump. And then there'll be a little step function. So this thing is called the empirical mass function, empirical distribution function, and it's usually called f and hat because it's a function of the sample size n. And we will hopefully cover the fundamental theorem of statistics, which is called the glevenko zentelli diagram, which guarantees that uh, that this empirical distribution function converges uniformly, so I can draw a tube as tight as I want around the true f, okay, and then this jumpy thing, which is just hops of size 1 over n at each point the data falls, will be inside this tube as tight as I want, provided I can make n as large as I want, and it gives uh, inequality guarantees, right, that's just a uh, very quick crash course of non-parametric inference, right? And you know, in this data science eight course at Berkeley, they do this at the freshman level. So it's not a. But what I'm interested in is um, something called uh, uh, it's a it's a non-parametric uh, Bayesian view as well. So, so in in Bayesian inference, which we'll cover a little bit as well. So you know, this unknown parameter theta. Let's say in this example, or mu or theta is just in one B. Uh, in the frequentist paradigm. You assume that this theta is some fixed but unknown parameter. Okay, so the, uh, one natural way to see a deterministic number as a distribution is to say that it's zero if you see it as a density or you know, or as a distribution. You know, it'll it'll basically punch a hole here and put a and land here. You know, this is it's uh, left continuous with right limits. Doesn't matter. So you know this is one way to see, right? It puts all its mass at one point. So that's the way to see a deterministic number as a distribution. So this is kind of the frequentist point of view. You don't know what theta is. There is some true theta star that these data came from, and you're trying to hunt it. But in a Bayesian framework, you have a slightly different idea. You say, 
Well, I actually want to relax this assumption. I want to say, well, maybe I know theta is like somewhere between here and here. So then you turn that into what's called a prior distribution. And then um, both the frequentist uh, schools and the likelihood and the Bayesian schools use something called the likelihood function, which we'll see later. But, um, it's basically the conditional probability of the data given the parameter. And uh, so in the Bayesian school, you will multiply the prior by the likelihood, and that's what's called the posterior. Right? We'll see all this in a bit more slowly and in detail later. So that's what I'm, I'm I mean, that's the perspective I'm taking here. And I'm not doing any natural language processing at this point, because I want to do as simple as possible. So what we do is this. So we look at the, 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 the raw data, which we will try to parse next. So I, I um, so let's see, let's look at this raw. Yeah, this one's written for some journal that wants tables in the bottom. So we have this offense punishment pairs, right? So, okay, every court case gets heard. And then at the end of the day, you have this these categories, right? You have offense categories and punishment categories. And uh, without loss of generality for me, uh, no punishment is also a punishment category. Uh, which is usually, you know, or not guilty is a punishment category, just to keep things language simple. So, you know, you can be uh, creating this offense of breaking peace, damage, deception, kill, and miscellaneous. It's that big list that changes on time. The royal offense is when you go and steal uh, the king's animal to eat, feed your family. <laughs> it's, not, it's not allowed. Uh, sexual offense, theft, violent theft, and so on. So, of course, some of these categories are time dependent, right? Uh, punishment categories are not guilty, corporal, uh, death, in prison, miscellaneous punishment, no punishment, and transport. Transport is when, um, when Britain had the penal colony in America first, and then the Americans kicked them out with independence, and then you can see that all that effect in the non parametric models. And then, of course, they destroyed Australia. It's a lot cheaper to transport people than to hold them in prison. Yeah? If they have increased in the uh, I think it's more or less a well, no, I mean, uh, these are, so I'm, so when I say all these things, like I'm basically like sort of projecting these discussions here. So two of these authors are historians and one of them is a specialist on Old Bailey Online, like she reads every case study. And so I'm not making things up, but you can look at this. So, uh, and, and in fact, the, the figures in the bottom show how with the discovery of Australia as a penal colony, it, it's, it's economically sensible to do this. I mean, what I, what I, um, so what we do then is basically, you know, create some very simple models of uh, counts. So this is, you know, just like contingency tables. I have like punishments. So my OI and PI are my offense and punishment pairs. And, um, yeah. And then I uh, basically get a big, get a, get a table, right? Well, you can think of it as a table or just an ordered pair of. Offense one, punishment one, they're uh, subscripted because um, data points. So this is my 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 case is just as simple as this, right? Um, OI and PI. So each case basically is one of these you know subscripted things. And um, yes, this is a very crude summary. But then I can now do this for every time block. So maybe I'm looking at every three years or every year. What are the cases heard? What is it? Offense, what was the punishment? And uh, then you can just do very simple things like is there a, so let's construct a you know dependent model where or independent model where the offense uh, is independent of the punishment. Just to see if that's a null hypothesis we can reject. And uh, we can create more complicated dependence models, uh, dependent models where the offense uh, determines the punishment. Uh, just probabilistically speaking, right? That's kind of what all this uh, stuff is. So you have a probability of an offense, uh, to, you know, probability of a punishment, and an offense and a time uh, in a given time block. So this joint distribution, we can model it in many ways, depending on the situation. So and then this gives me this unknown parameter, uh, theta i, j, t. And i is one of nine elements, because uh, there are nine um, offenses, and j is one of seven elements, because there are seven uh, punishments. And then, um, so in, 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 in Bayesian or even just non parametric inference, what we mean is that these probabilities, these theta ij's, 
that uh, you know in the sort of uh, nine cos seven space. I mean, they they are elements of this time varying simplex. That means if I sum over all these unknown probabilities thetas for the offense and punishment in a given time block over the seven j's and the nine i's, I will get a number that sums to one. Moreover, each theta should be non-negative, so it can be zero or greater. So this is essentially, in 3D you can see it. So if I have this, this is my simplex basically, so this is theta one, theta two, theta three. So these is uh, zero, uh, one, zero, and this is uh, zero, zero, one, and this is the other um, point, right? Which is uh, one, zero, zero. So and then this little triangle sitting here, any point there is a theta one, theta two, theta three, and that's fair game for the unknown. So that's called the simplex. So I can, you know, um, and as time changes, the point is this changes. And of course, my simplex is in a, in a different, you know, nine plus seven. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of the main idea, and then you can define the likelihood, and the, you know. You can do various penalized likelihoods and model correction and all of this stuff. But, um, so then what did we do? I, we, we, we basically uh, tested various models. We looked for longitudinal model selection. Uh, we had this partition defense model, which um, gets, so we first of all reject that uh, the simplest model that, that offense is independent of punishments. Although initially it's a very tricky thing. It kind of, they're pretty brutal in the way people are punished. So you can actually see the Old Testament actually happening in real time. I'm talking about the tooth for a tooth part of Torah, right? Eye for an eye. That took a while. I think. So and then, you know, toward the end, uh, you know, they even abolished that penalty. And you can see the main uh, sort of New Testament. You, know, you get feet, you know, slapped, killed out of cheek, sort of coming in. I mean, this is my... So of course, we want to formalize this very carefully, right? So. And, and you can do quite a lot just with these very simple non parametric Bayesian methods. And in the partition offense model, what we basically start doing is, can I instead, okay, sure, the, the dependent model beats the independent model. So there is definitely some kind of punishment consequence that's a function of the offense. So not everyone gets killed, um, at least globally. But then, um, but then what you can start saying is, uh, I can look at all my offenses. And then, you know, there's seven of them, right? So let's say offense one through offense seven. Is there seven or nine offenses? Some number. It's seven or nine. So then uh, what I can say is, uh, you know, instead of saying, um, you know, each offense has its own punishment probability, right? Uh, PJ, I. Then what I, what I can say is maybe offenses in a certain block, so I can look at partitions of offenses, right? So this is now a set partition model. So our, uh, our offenses within a particular block of a particular partition of one through seven have the same probability. So now it gets really more interesting. And this is where the methodological war with analysts of applied statistics is. You know, we sort of checkmate them with air traffic in Japan, you know. That's a joke. <laughs> Um, that's a totally so basically you can do this, right? See, because I, I, I come from a constructive school of mathematics, so I do not want to use uh, a pseudo-random Monte Carlo methods that are provably, uh, uh, you know, heuristic, that they don't have guarantees that they work. I don't want to use it if I can avoid it. So, uh, so I've used a different way of doing this. And um, so this is, again, a problem with a lot of methodological people. So what I've done here is basically each time I split into uh, M N1 many partitions, so there's something like 1,700 of them. Uh, it's the sterling number of a second kind of seven. So it's a lot, but it's not that much. You can do this in a Python data frame in a laptop, right? In an old laptop. So then I, I have the sort of probability of going, uh, this is year one, and you, you know, first time block, second time block, and so on. And then I can say, let me have a Markov chain that runs through this uh, offense partition models through time, and then actually uh, start studying how the small cup chain is chasing these posterior probabilities and it's kind of simple but you know and uh, it makes some sense but of course it's not like uh, you know too complicated and in the end you can get these kinds of things I mean you, these things will make sense so we discuss heavily if you're in the digital history 
uh, that each of these spikes are correlated with specific events like uh, law change and uh, you know, Australia, whatever, American <coughs> independence, and you know, a lot more delicate things than that. So that's where uh, Heather Wolfram was really helpful. And uh, these are, Sorry. yeah. Yeah, so 1850 something happened. Uh, so let's look at it, see if I can recollect this. Um, let me see, so what's going on? Yeah, so theft is dropping and uh, violent theft is dropping and yeah, that's what's happening. I mean, I think that's maybe people are, I don't know, I have to really read the discussions myself, maybe people are, uh, I mean, it's complicated, right? Because jurisdictions change, like initially, like people that were being bad in the Navy were punished here, but then, you know, the armed forces started having their own. It's very, I think Heather discusses them in glorious detail in the discussions, but, but the, all the standard um, sequences were sort of making sense. But if you look at the punishments, it's actually really clear, like imprisonment and transport uh, are always, you see, Transport starts uh, going up and going down. <laughs> you know, this is, I think this is American independence, right? I mean, and then Australia, and then I don't know. And, I mean, we, we, we kind of discussed it, but the point is we're doing very, very simple multiplications and additions, right? Days in non from there's not a lot going on. And then this, uh, this partition thing is even more complex. This is for the simpler model. But it, it makes a lot of historical sense, and then you need you need a historian to help you interpret this in a sensible way. Right? Um, so let's look at uh, what I wanted to show you guys is something a bit more interesting with the partition models. So these are essentially a way of summarizing these visits of that Markov chain. But then let's look at the actual um, the high posterior paths. So now it gets interesting. Right? So this one is the partitions for the best offen partition, offense partition model uh, that can vary every three years. So we try to vary the time blocks as well, I mean, in a, in a uniform partition, which is not something the statisticians like because they wanted to have jump points. But then you have to go to something called a reversible jump MCMC, which becomes a heuristic algorithm. So I didn't want to do it. But you know, roughly between three to 11 years, no matter what uh, school of methodological statistics you use, these offense partition models are, are actually changing. You know, it, they really are very uh, nicely explaining the data. So what you can make sense of here is around 1674, uh, you know, if you look at the partition with blocks sorted by the probability of death, okay? Uh, so this is uh, death as a punishment, right? So then, um, if you did damage or kill or sexual theft or violent theft, your probability of being sentenced to death or you know whether you actually get pardoned or not as a separate issue is 38.5%. Uh, That's a pretty harsh system, <laughs> at least at that time, relative to what happens down the road, right? And then uh, you know for breaking peace, deception, miscellaneous, and royal offense, it's a pretty high probability of. Uh, so then, you know, it slowly evolves, uh, and you can start seeing how pretty soon, um, you know, only when you start killing, you get uh, sentenced to death, but also not with a very high probability, only, you know, 7%, right? So this is what I mean by, you can see the effects of sort of, you know, Old Testament sort of pops around here, the New Testament really pops around here. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, we sort of look at other other, the next most probable path and things like this, so we're not overly looking into the data. Um, of course, you know, this is uh, something to properly understand. Uh, There's a lot more you need to have under your belt, but I just wanted to throw that there so that uh, the XML we're about to parse <laughs> has a point, okay? So, um, and that's what we're gonna do next so that, because uh, you guys need to be able to parse XML files to call yourselves, um, you know, scalable XML parsers. <laughs> so what I've done here is uh, this, um, you know, this will not exist for you. This is analyzing the full Old Bailey online. And um, if you want to actually, you know, download it, there's, there are steps here on how to download the data. Um, should be steps here. Um, 
Yeah, so here we go. So there's this download instructions. Um, yeah, so you can sort of start from, yeah, you can just download this tiny one if you want, or the, the full blown one using wget. And then I'm just sort of, uh, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. And then you can unzip it. And, um, and then we're just sort of putting this in, uh, in uh, making a directory called datasets old daily online OBO and TEI. And then um, here is, um, now it's in our local file system. Then I just have to copy to the distributed file system. And unfortunately this will take 18.74 minutes. So it's not really something we wanna do now. Okay, but uh, it's doable. Um, so if you look at uh, what's in there, there is uh, ordinary accounts and sessions papers and um, right, so this is mostly uh, sort of a little service to the um, community. So then uh, XML is extended markup language. So it's like HTML, but it's, uh, it's extensible. So you have these little tags, right? With square brackets, uh, angle brackets. And um, and it's a very um, important format, especially for digital humanities. JSON is the other one, Java, um, uh, object notation, but um, XML is very good for rich content. So what I've done here is just, um, you know, um, read the whole text files. And um, so the whole text files method, remember, will read it file by file and keep a string for the file name and the content as the second element. We did this at the um, um, POA, um, State of the Union, SOU, State of the Union addresses. So then uh, I'm just going to um, look at uh, what's um, in this, uh, you know, one session papers. And once again, you'll get the string and string. So we can read each one and um, then we can sort of uh, just take that XML and um, you know, we can take this raw one particular file and map. So this is basically getting each element, the second part, which is the contents of the file. And then let's just take the first element and take a peek at what's in this XML file as a string. And um, so now we can see this actual content. So there's a lot of information, right? Um, so it's the version UTF-8 encoding as text, uh, text, uh, there'll be a text termination tag with a slash text down below, this body opens and um, div zero type to session paper, and session paper ID. Now, why is this not unrelated to social media? And this is a very simple problem. Okay? I don't think there is any big difference at the end of the day. Right? So why were people, why was there this record? What was the economic incentive for having a very detailed record? Yeah, people just wanted to read stuff. Like they, it's like tabloid, whatever, like news, you know? Like, what did this guy do? What happened? So people are very passionate about what was going on. There was actually a market to sell this, right? Printing press was like skyrocketing around that. So it's, uh, you know, people really like what's going on. And in some sense, I, I don't think there's a very much difference in social media. It's just a lot more targeted and stuff, but it's the same idea, same principle. So, um, so you know, it was very well read and there's a market for it. So people actually, you know, it was uh, economically sensible to do this. So you can look at this, uh, the proceedings at the sessions of the peace and the OIR and terminer of the City of London and the King's Commission of Gold Delivery. Of, so this is actually, you know, uh, what was read right before the right honorable sir, person name ID, you know, whatever, some ID. Uh, this is a type as judiciary name. Judiciary name is Edward Becker, um, uh, surname, given name, gender. <laughs> Uh, uh, Lord Mayor of the City of London, right? And then this is actual um, uh, uh, content, a uh, third. And then this is the other person, the other judiciary name. And uh, it continues on, right? So you have um, another judiciary name, surname, juror name, juror gender. Uh, I mean, you can do all kinds of analysis here if, you, if you're into this world, right? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to show you this so that you don't just take these counts. I just did this because it's just some arithmetic. It's easier, but uh, but then if you want to get into this, you really need to you know get get a PhD in this world. I think. Um, so here is other Jira names, and I think eventually we'll get to. Um, let's see. Daily defendant name. Okay, so what is this? James Haddock, male. Okay, what is he doing? The offense category is theft. So, um, and uh, theft from a place, offense subcategory is theft from a place. Um, feloniously stealing two guineas and five liters, six small in silver and a silver cup, a silver corkscrew, till two silver spoons and a nutmeg grater. Nutmeg grater. That's cute. In the dwelling house of the victim name, James Reeves, gender, you know, offense category type, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 9th of April and in the 13th year of his uh, late majesty, King Lord the First, right? And... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot going on, and all of that is XML tags. So this is why this is called a quintessential data set for digital humanities. And I don't know, Amelia, like, if you get these transcripts from Swedish courts, is it, is it, uh, it's probably not XML tagged, right? It'll be, okay, yeah. it'll be PDF. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to do an optical character. <laughs> That's the whole industry, right? So, uh... Optical character recognition, I think the best, um, do you guys know this? Uh, Tesseract. Yeah, Tesseract OCR is Google's open source uh, optical, optical character recognition. It's very, very decent. We played with this at work. Oh, so somebody has done that on the Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, at least from level work, you know, some yeah, but I mean Tesseract is okay, you know, it's kind of almost state of the arts or whatever. But you have to customize it for your domain, you know, and uh, and you have to do a lot of manual cleaning, and that's kind of what's done for OBO um, because they had all this grant money for years, literally decades. So um, anyway, I mean maybe you know you can pressure the EU to make the Swedish transcripts in XML. <laughs> <laughs> by default. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to kind of show you guys the complexity of... Uh, so then what do we do? We want to do this uh, scala.xml.capitalxml load string. This is already, uh, uh, you know, a Scala XML parsing thing that's already there for you. So this is how you would take um, take that X we made upstairs and turn it into uh, uh, an element. So this is now a Scala XML element. So once you've done this, um, you know, you can ask what's the element, and it'll just print that out. And then you can, um, you know, start doing this. If you want a pretty printer and plain text, you can sort of format it like this, so it's a little easier to read. Okay, it's a simple thing. It's a lot easier than the raw stuff, I think, to read. Um, then, you know, how did I learn XML? I just kind of randomly did Google searches and found some blogs, so I sort of read these things. Um, and then I sort of cooked up the things upstairs, so it's a good idea for you to dive into those if you want. And then um, this is our big parsing problem uh, we wanted to do. Uh, we wanted to simply be able to get the counts of all these uh, events, right? So. What I'm doing here is uh, types of dev zero. So this is one of the nodes there, um, which is the singleton root node for the file. And I want to get uh, um, a text, right? So I, I want to map uh, every node and then check that the node is uh, 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 type zero and then get it as a text. So now I, uh, I have my types of div one nodes. So this is basically how I can get my um, div one node types. So I know this is front matter, trial account, trial account. Uh, all these are various uh, type, uh, the div one type nodes. Then I can ask what's the, um, 
So, you know, I'm basically descending because my goal is to show you how I got the counts for that uh, non parametric thing, right? Um, so, I'm basically now filtering each node uh, of app type and getting the text account and uh, seeing if it's a trial account because I'm not interested in all the other uh, types. And then I want the uh, uh, node type and the node ID. So th this gives me my trial account and the trial account ID. Right? So this is sort of my starting point. And then uh, I'm, you know, continuing on and uh, getting the value of the text. So I'm getting uh, offense uh, subcategory and, you know, whether it's a theft or a theft from a place and Okay, so then, then I, I said, okay, now I actually want certain fields. So I'm only interested in verdict category, punishment category, and offense category. I'm not going to descend into subcategories. This is just already some in dimensions. Doing all the set partitions is quite a lot. Um, so then um, that's, that's basically um, all done together now. And I'm getting my trial account IDs uh, affiliated with uh, my um, offense category and my Punishment category. I mean, I'm not saying you should follow all the details, but you know, now I do reduce by key, so I'm just going to be um, counting the number of times um, this stuff happens, and I'm getting closer to what I want. So now I have my my theft. You know, so I, so each thing is a theft occurred once. I was not guilty. The ID is this theft occurred again, and so on. Okay. And the nice thing is the ID has the timestamp, so I don't have to do any joins or anything. So it's actually the, the, the year, month, and day. So then I can uh, just print this to see if this is uh, making sense. Yes, it's a theft. There is not guilty uh, ID. You know, there are two thefts. So it could be, uh, you know, two specific events, or it could be, yeah, you have to go and descend into it. Uh, so we played enough. So step one is exploring data first, XML parsing in Scala, and to understand what to do now uh, with our XML data. So this is uh, essentially everything strung up together. So with sessions papers. So now I want to uh, clean this directory, save this thing I've made into a text file, and. Uh, and then I should be able to see this in a distributed file store with, for trial counts. And that's my input to my non-parametric um, method. Okay. Um, yeah, so here is, uh, so in interest of time, so this is the schema that uh, comes out of this, breaking piece, corporal damage, death, blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, then I can turn this into a, into a nice uh, trial counts data frame that is 197,000 or one, oops, 197,751 trials um, in this store and or in this old daily online. And, and then we start seeing, you know, null values, right? This is a nullable thing. So we need to field that. So I then, this is very, very useful. So you just uh, fill the nulls with zero with this one command. So then all the nulls become zero. Now I'm getting close to uh, some integer uh, count matrix I want. And that's the data I kind of made available because a lot of statisticians in uh, uh, New Zealand and elsewhere really like this data, but they just, I told them, uh, oh, just go and run this notebook, you'll get the thing you can download. And say, oh, just give me the file, Ross. Okay, fine. So I just put this like uh, recently because uh, there was this really uh, nice statistician come lad say, um, in, in Wellington, um, there's transforms named after him and stuff. So anyway, they're, they're doing some, some analysis with it. So you can just directly get the data from the CSV file as well. So, I mean, that was mainly just to show you guys, there is a whole universe outside Twitter and it's big, it's a big market. And, uh, if you guys are really into this, there's incredibly many opportunities, uh, you know, both in academia and industry, uh, to 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 yeah to understand humanities and to be able to do data science operations in a meaningful way, working with domain experts, not telling the domain experts how much more maths you know. No one really cares about that, but to work with them and understand like why is this spiking? What was the law change? That's really valuable. 
uh, and there's, uh, in fact, a lot of jobs advertised in London, you know, a, a few months ago, because the student numbers are huge for master's programs. I think we will skip this. I really don't want to like hold you guys, but you know the stuff Simon talked about, topic modeling and latent directly allocation, it's there. It's just another, uh, you know, uh, unsupervised classification method that originally comes from population genetics. You can play with this. Uh, there's all these videos of the guy who invented this. It's a very recent video. You can watch if you want. And um, you know, it's just um, in the end, what we're basically doing with latent directly allocation is um, it is a 20 news groups data set. So these are people blogging away in news groups, and then we're trying to clean the data and classify them. And um, I will finish on time. So, you know, and we do feature extraction, text tokenization. So all of these are machine learning pipelines. These are things that are already in Apache Spark. So there's a whole universe there we can get into. Uh, regex tokenizer, you know, remember Simon was removing white spaces and weird characters, so you can define any regex tokenizer and have it part of your machine learning pipeline and, and um, so, you know, this is not homework or anything, but if you want to figure out, uh, you know, scalable latent directly allocation, so you can do this on millions of tweets, which Simon can do. You can do this, you know, stop words remover, remember Simon had stop words he removed, so you can have stop words that you can remove and and chain them all together in a nice uh, way, scalable way. And then there's a vector of token counts, which basically you know, takes your tokens, which are words that you've cleaned up and then converts them into, into counts. It uses all these uh, you know, right formats that you need to feed into this linear algebra MLlib vector object. And, and then in the end, you can create an LDA model with this so-called online variational base, which is a whole bunch of new stuff. But it's a very, very powerful Bayesian uh, way of, of handling very large data sets. And it essentially turns the Bayesian uh, you know, estimation problem, uh, or the map estimation problem, into, a, into a, a, an optimization problem in, in a very nice way. Maybe we'll get to this in the foundations course, but it's quite advanced topics, but you can use it like a black box like Simon was doing. And, uh, and if you're in a hurry, you can figure out in two and a half minutes from this video, this is the same guy on the top when he was younger, at NIPS 2010, uh, talking about um, online variational base. Ooh, that's a typo, variational. So anyway, um, in the end, what we do is we get these top indices like Simon was doing. You can get your vocabulary list and run this model by topics and then you can sort of list what are the interesting topics are and what are the keywords that make these topics are and you'll get these say top you know 20 topics because you set the number of topics fixed like you know in the k means algorithm is k equals some number and remember simon set k in his talk to 400 or something right for his me two thing 200 or some fixed number so here i fixed it to 20 because uh, i know there's um, roughly that many news groups and then it gives me these topics you know topic zero has article picture think morality and so on and um, I think yeah now I'm getting to model tuning and I refilter stop words because in reality this won't make sense the first time it runs so you have to do a bit more pull your sleeves up maybe you have to define your own stop words in a domain specific way so you, you remove them and again you play the same game with the cleaned out stuff and then how do you figure out the default values that are inside this black box? So this is, it tells you how to descend into the docs to figure out the default values and stuff like this. And this was done over, you know, um, a long set of lectures, but it's there. And then you can get into um, LDA model. And this one, you know, gets a lot better, like space and shuttle and uh, redesign or on one topic, people, church, Jesus, Bible, or in another topic, so it's starting to make sense. And then um, this is another way of doing LDA using the expectation maximization algorithm, which is another algorithm, not the online variational base. Again, don't worry if you don't know what these are. If you do know, you know them. So this is again uh, running the same model using a different, uh, uh, you know, statistical framework and an associated optimization framework. And um, we can do, you know, similar things. Uh, and in the end, there's some kind of D3 plot. And this also produces some sensible results. And then we can kind of visualize them in this sort of D3 way. And so here's, you know, Microsoft Windows topic and, um, yeah. So there is, um, yeah, 
topics by government and you know, sort, of, sort of sorry space and so on. So this is what Simon was doing. I know it's a big rush, but if you want to descend into it, it's there and uh, and it's a very powerful way of um, of doing things. Now, in the last minute, <laughs> I will say that uh, I did this thing uh, just for myself. This is Cornell movie dialogue, so you can take these little dialogue snippets in Cornell's movie database. So I did all the processing from scratch because it's not like this preloaded thing. And then you can kind of get the same um, uh, topic modeling done after a lot more uh, more careful ETL because it's uh, you will see if you get into it. And in fact, most of the time you'll be doing, you know, because these Cornell guys put this plus, 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 plus as a delimiter because they didn't want to use commas because commas appear in dialogues, right? So you kind of have to do these breaks differently. And so then you kind of have to descend into all your Spark SQL knowledge and explode in various functions. But in the end, you get this uh, topic modeling of movies by their dialogues, right? So I had a little company for a few months or a year, and sold our product finally. And all I got out of it was this laptop. So I was doing a lot of, uh, you know, two days prototype <laughs> your problem for you type thing, right? But anyway, most people didn't pay any money just to call the code. It's okay. So this is uh, something like this we were doing. And, and in the end, you will get this, um, you know, this little dialogues that come uh, with various probabilities for each topic. And, um, you know, so I love you, man, or I love you too, I love you too, I love you, man. So this is all dialogues in different movies are on the same topic, right? So what did you say? <laughs> I love you too. I don't know. It, it made sense, so I stopped. <laughs> I mean, it's not perfect, but it's not. And, and you know, it's kind of cute, right? You could have like some kind of little recommendation engine of just having YouTube feeds into little meetings. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's. I love this one. Gone money, shit, fuck, kill. <laughs> this is the most prominent words in one set of topics of dialogues and movies. I haven't watched those movies, but uh, yeah. These things are just there. Uh, you know, this is uh, Joachim's project that he did. You can watch this video if you want on the UK election stuff if you want to really understand what the, those trees are coming from. And this is uh, Mariama who. Uh, um, is here, but she already gave a video about how she took the article topics in the retweet network where she's now doing web scraping using the scalable uh, way, using map partitions and actually grabbing the contents of the URL entities in the tweets of interest and then grabbing the actual content from the web page of the newspaper article and then doing topic modeling on all of that. So this is uh, a lot of uh, hard work. It's totally, uh, and you know, she gives you the exact details of how she uses uh, this particular, um, yeah, this is again, chapter six of uh, Mastering Spark book, this Goose library, which is the Scala scraper. All right, uh, this is finally the assignment, you know, because we started a couple minutes late. So I'd say it's open-ended, do what you want. You are the data controller. <laughs> So please don't hit this publish button. You know, in, in you know, in your community edition, there is that publish button. Don't hit it. In fact, I'll re-upload my my DBC file because I don't want to, uh, you know, you know, in my data frame table, there is all that extra display, like a few of those things. I actually really don't want it there. Although Trump won't mind, I think. But you know, uh, so you want to kind of clear the outputs before you share anything publicly, just to be safe. But then, of course, you can do experiments on your own and, you know, you can build your own insights. So do something and it um, doesn't have to be with Twitter, but um, and then you can show me you, you've done something. So then, especially the undergrads or master's students, I'm supposed to grade you like so I can tick you off for that. Sorry, it's a lot of content. So I thought I had too little, but <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so you apparently haven't read the deduplication chapter in detail yet, have you? No. Okay, so that's what these guys do, Spark Summit. Dublin 20, what is last year, 2017, um, Andrew deduplication 
So they do this in a streaming way means way. Uh, yeah, I think it's in YouTube. So you know, it's, it's this talk that they do where they have like this branching process of this K, K, K clusters of topics from news articles where they hit it with deduplication algorithms because a lot of the articles will be almost the same content and they do very clever things, uh, you know. So I don't know, it's one of these, uh, these, these talks uh, on deduplication. So I mean, I, I kind of avoid NLP because I, as I said, <laughs> I speak a lot of languages, like what, it's very difficult to really know what strings <laughs> mean. <laughs> so I, I, what I've been doing, even with my Twitter stuff, I try and provide these trees and forests to provide a context for natural language processing researchers to do better at their job rather than do NLP myself. That's been my style so far because uh, I, I mean, I had my second PhD student won some second prize in a multilingual word sense disambiguation problem is one of the top uh, conferences in, in, in natural language processing. So I can say I'm an expert, but, but I know how simple that was. So that's why I'm saying I'm not an expert, right? Um, anyway, have a good life until next Thursday. So um, I'm looking forward to my bottle of tequila tonight. <laughs>